From KCRW in Santa Monica, this is The Treatment. It's The Treatment. I'd like to welcome back a guest who's been here at least once before. Try to get him every time he has a movie out. Paul Thomas Anderson, whose new movie is an old movie. It's the release of Punch Drunk Love on DVD. Paul, thanks for coming back. Hi, Elvis. Tell me about supervising something like this. I mean, because there's so many times when you see the DVD release and the things that we're attracted to, like maybe the sound mix or a certain kind of color gradation, isn't there. And how involved did you get with all that? As involved as I can, as involved, follow it all the way through. You know, the movie's going to be on DVD and shelf a lot longer than it's going to be in the movie theaters. And that's what's great about a DVD is you're sort of preserving it, at least for right now, in the best possible format. So I'll do the transfer, spend as much as much time as it takes to get that right. Um, that can kind of be an arduous process, but if you sort of do it diligently, I'd usually go in for like a couple hours a day because you can't stare at anything more than a couple hours a day, work on the transfer, and then... You sort of adjust the mix a little bit to kind of know that it's not playing in a big movie theater. It's going to play at home, and what does that mean? And you just slight adjustments that you do and kind of follow that stuff through. It feels like it feels like part of the job, part of the obligation. It's funny now because you say this, and I think that it almost sounds like you're describing the post-production process where you are so immersed in it that you just want to get away. You need the time, and then basically... Less than a year later, you're basically back in post-production again, well, you, aren't you? you know, it's funny you should say that because we'd gone through a long post on this movie. And by the time you you get to the video transfer, I think most people are just so burned out that they might just throw it away. They just hand it off to somebody else, just say, you do it. I've got to go away from the movie. But we had a real luxury in this. I think this is why the movie's coming out a little bit later on DVD is that I did, I did take a break from it and walked away. It was sort of the healthiest thing I could have done because... Which you're sitting in the in the theater all day long, and you kind of to go to a TV monitor after that, you're always going to be frustrated. You're always going to be you're always going to be striving to make it look like film. Which there are things that you can do to help kind of preserve and keep intact the sort of the contrast that you might see in a movie theater, but it's really a frustrating thing. So it was just a smart thing to do on this was to just get away from it for a couple months, walk away, and then come back and look at it in a whole new way, which is just on a TV. Remind our listeners what the movie Punch Drunk Love is about. It's about uh, Barry Egan, played by Adam Sandler, and Emily Watson one morning comes into his life, and so does a harmonium, and um, uh, he's uh, and uh, hopefully takes him on a nice, crazy journey through through Los Angeles and to Hawaii, and it's just a rom- it's a romantic picture, really, and uh, Adam has seven sisters, and the movie, which uh, caused him a lot of trouble, and I'm trying to remember what the movie's about. <laughs> really, <laughs> it's not a very good sales job. But um, well, what I what it's really about is just this kind of romantic constancy and this need that these two people have at a certain time. And when after I saw it, and we talked about it, I told you it reminded me of not only the Blake Edwards in terms of the phys- physical comedy stuff. But also the Blake Edwards of the Days of Wine and Roses, yeah. that kind of sort of need, this this hunger these people have that they end up feeling this weird way. And I was kind of wondering, in addition to the Tati aspects, if that was important for you too, that the whole sort of Blake Edwards thing. Blake Edwards is such a huge influence for me, not on this movie, but when I was a kid, I can remember seeing SOB in the theater uh, and just... Uh, I think he made Los Angeles movies, so it was easy for me to really relate to them because you were like 10 or SOB or real Los Angeles movies, and you sort of see Malibu and the beach, you see the colors of them. So there was some, not only were they making me laugh, but I could, being from Los Angeles, I, 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 could, I could see them in a certain way that made me full of pride for, for where I was from, you know. But he, he really has that. That I mean, there's a Lubitsch touch for sure, but I think there's a Blake Edwards touch, you know, that sort of letting things play out, and he's sort of dastardly underneath it, but um, very long, long shots, and and just just funny, you know. But 
I don't know. You do always sense something troubling underneath it. Even the Pink Panther movies, which are just pure, pure funny. There's well, always that, something dangerous lurking underneath. Well, that first one, though, basically, he's the cuckold, and he's um, he's basically sort of led off to jail. It's kind of heartbreaking. Nobody remembers that. It's it's really a bittersweet ending, the, it's the true. Pink Panther. Absolutely true, you know. Blake Edwards, I, you know, I don't know. He should never be underestimated. Somebody. Do people underestimate made, made them? Do they, 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 they forget? And they... I think maybe they do. My guess is I should remind people is Paul Thomas Anderson we're talking about, in addition to Blake Edwards, the DVD release of Punch Drunk Love. But I thought of Edwards in, in your movie, the scene where Adam goes to the truck where the guys are and, he's, and everything happens basically in one long shot. He falls out of the frame and goes over to them. That's a very Blake Edwards kind of a setup, that sort of constant movement. Yeah. Basically, this uh, there's a trajectory to the comedy almost, you know? Yeah. No, that's it right there. I mean, I can remember thinking, put your best Blake Edwards hat on and kind of try and do that. And just to do, to choreograph things, it's like, he must have been watching some Vincent Minnell movies because just when you get there on the day to sort of do those things, you you're he always shot in Cinemascope too, and I like to do that too. So much fun to try and fill the frame with the gags and where are the gags coming from and where are they going to and how somebody moves around a room. It kind of becomes like a musical number. And there's something very musical about, hopefully about this movie and certainly about Blake Edwards' movies that was a big influence. I was watching the P- the Pink Panther movies a lot when I was writing the movie. I was in Hawaii. and Also, too, I think I um, Adam has kind of always reminded me of Peter Sellers a little bit, just sort of physically can kind of move around a room a lot like Peter Sellers can. And, but you must have thought too, because the great the thing that he can really do, and I just think about one of my favorite scenes in Happy Gilmore's when he's in the bar, and he just breaks the beer bottle and he's ready to get into a fight. Mm-hmm. I mean, that just like it comes out of nowhere. But there's that weird contrast with this character who's almost always unfailingly polite. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> to go to to go nuts. Adam does that really well, and I th- I don't I think that's. Do you know people like that? People that can go from zero to. A hundred really fast. I mean, I think I knew kids like that when I was in junior high. That's high the thing, school. though. You, you know, kids like that. You don't often know adults like that, or else they're like Jackie Gleason. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know many. I, I know. I know that. I know myself. I know that I can have. I've I've been prone to sort of temper tantrums where you just feel yourself j- jump out of your skin. You know, and, and you sort of always wonder where did that come from? Didn't I leave that behind in high school or something like that? And, um. I don't know. It seemed that Adam was really good at that, and to do that in a movie was going to be fun. Where does that come from for that character, though? Because well, for Adam in the movie, it's um, I think it's a long his upbringing with seven sisters. You know, that's I don't. Do you grow up in a big family? I grew up with seven sisters. There you go. <laughs> that explains everything about me, right? It does. But did you feel that there's a pack mentality sometimes, I think? I mean, were you at the bottom or were you at the top? Um, I have one brother, so I was right in the middle. Right in the middle, yeah. I think that there can be like that smell of blood sometimes in big families, you know, where it just kind of is like, you know, who's weak here? Who's weak? We're going to get you. We're coming after you. And um, I think that Adam was obviously probably the youngest of, of, of seven kids and had or eight kids and had seven sisters and... That probably contributes a lot to how somebody lives their adult life, you know, probably feeling a bit beaten up and a bit torn up. And um, and the only way that you can express yourself among a pack is to just completely go through the roof, completely fight back and claw your way out. So I think it's sort of like there's two speeds that, that he ends up operating on, which is either sweet as pie or like crazy. See, when you say that, I just end up thinking there's so much about people trying not to step into an, an area of emotional excess in your movies. And that's kind of a thread that, that runs in people. It's just trying to sort of basically hmm. keep the status quo going. And this is about, because it's shorter, I mean, it really is exaggerating that kind of that jump from that one extreme to the other. Yeah. I like that. I think that's an... I, I, I suppose I go through through... Uh, the majority of the day feeling like I just kind of want to keep it together, whether it's from stuff inside my own head or stuff that's going on in the world. You just, that, that that's probably how I feel a lot. You just w- kind of want to go mad and rip things up half the time, you know, the state of things, but it's just sort of, well, I'll just try and keep it together here for a little while. But that's funny because 
when the excess happens, it's always it's kind of surprising because you still think, even until it happens in the movies, be it the scene with the frogs in, in Magnolia or him going over to the truck in Punch Drunk Love, mm-hmm. you don't really know that it's going to happen I mean, because there's so much about getting so close to sort of the edge of that, that precipice and is he actually going to fall off? It becomes like this really melodramatic version of like a Chuck Jones cartoon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's good. Half the times, I don't know, I found myself whenever I'm making a movie, feel like when you're really in the middle of it, you feel like somehow, somehow get that feeling where you just wish it could be a cartoon. And I don't have any aspirations to be an animator or anything like that, but it's just sort of like you want, you want to break out of it being a movie somehow. You just somehow, that thing about going over the truck, I can remember thinking this could kind of feel like a, like a, like a Fred Astaire and a Fred Astaire meets a... Jackie Chan with a little Looney Tunes involved. It would be a, it would be a good scene. It's funny that you should say that. It, well, I just can't end up thinking that I guess, and because the movie seems to either be certainly it's incredibly static for the first five, the actual first five minutes of the picture. Yeah, yeah. To a lot of movement, and and I wonder what made you think about because it. again, it's, it's extremes seem to be so much a part of what you do in the movies, and I was wondering if that was how you chart that out in something like Punch Drunk Love. Yeah, it's it's pretty char. I think it's charted out. I like extremes in movies. I like extremes in music too. And um, just when you know, maybe sort of slow intro or a first verse that's kind of thing, and a chorus that goes through the roof or something. There's always something fun about that. Just big dynamics. But the big dynamics I plotted out along with propelling the story along. You know, that kind of that feeling to sort of start the movie with a sort of slow mystery, a slow groove, but that when it really started, you know, sort of leading up to its, to launching it, I guess launching the story, to launching uh, where you were going. Uh, does that answer the question? No, it it does. Mm-hmm. I guess it's Paul Thomas Anderson. So we're talking about Punch Drunk Love and its DVD release because, because of that, because it does move so much from one to another. I mean, I think part of that for me, and I guess I'll ask you this, is about the compression of time because in the other movies, even in, in your first movie, there's, there's it's a bit more languorous, so yeah. it's going a bit slower. But here, because it is so much shorter, I was just wondering, too, about your building that in because you have to get so much faster from one end to the other. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, really sort of building it in, in smaller chunks, almost kind of like... Maybe like two and a half or three minute chunks, almost like you could sort of like break. I always break things sort of down musically, I think, where you could sort of say, if you looked at it like a 90 minute record, you could kind of break it down into the three minute songs with little interludes here and there, you know, just as bridge pieces. But it was the only way that I could learn how to make a 90 minute movie, you know, was to sort of break it down into small chunks that could feel musical. Here's a slow, here's a slow moving song. Here's a, here's a driving force. Here's a sort of, here's the big middle. You know, and how do we kind of come back down? Um, cause it's funny because I watched the movie for the first time um, a couple weeks ago, and I, you know, you're sort of able to always sort of see what it is when you're further away from it. I hadn't seen it in so long, and I was able to watch it and feel like um, feel like it was a pretty good, pretty good, pretty good um, small puzzle. I was very proud of its structure, and, it, and it's funny because I didn't really set out with so many ideas of structure in mind at first. Um, um, I knew that I needed it to be short. I knew that I was desperate to make a short movie, you know, just sort of like, when I listen to those Beatles songs and you hear like, you hear help or something like that and you realize it's two and a half minutes long. That's a strong pop song and everything was conveyed, you know. Uh, Sure, we should take a break. We'll be back with Paul Thomas Anderson talking about his movie and concept album, Punch Drunk Love. It's the treatment. (laughs) You're listening to The Treatment with Elvis Mitchell from the studios of KCRW Santa Monica. Back is the treatment. My guest is Paul Thomas Anderson. Punch Trunk Love is now on DVD. You're talking about music, 
And I wonder, I said concept album, I was only half joking about that because mm. I wonder if you sort of sit and think about is this something like, the movie actually sounds to me like a day in the life. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really end up doing it on this movie, but I always think I, I set out, you just think like, can I get rid of dialogue? Can I get rid of every piece of dialogue? Um, just because it just would be my dream to someday make a movie that's just purely visual and purely music. It just... But there are long stretches of this movie where there are no dialogue. Absolutely. No, I guess I'm just being hard on myself, and I would love to kind of push that even further because there is something kind of great and just like a wash over you, that feeling that you get I, um, when when you can just enjoy a movie and just stop people from talking so much. There's just... Um, it just feels like when you're working with great actors, too, you have a, somebody with a great face or a great walk. You can do so much just with that, just to trust that and trust that they can get that across and the music can get it across. And I know that for me, when I've had times watching movies that are that reach that place that just purely propel along without anybody mucking it up with things that they're saying, it just can kind of take your whole body over and really enjoy that. Baraka is a great example that that movies movies like that, um, and even Pink Panther we were talking about before long stretches, and movies like Coyanna Scott see like that for you too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, those are those are great examples. And you know, but even the silent movies, the great comedies, you know, well there you go. It's there's nobody's talking, and half the time just thank God, let me let me breathe. I don't know. There's something sort of. I think it comes from if you're a writer, you you sort of you get. You, sort of get choked up on so many words and when the director comes to the set you just sort of want to get rid of everything. It seems to me part of it too and actually the reason I brought up Chuck Jones is because of that silence because in those Roadrunner cartoons there's no dialogue mm. and so much is conveyed with sound and movement and that's what it seemed like. To yeah. Me. Does it help to have somebody like Adam Sandler who's so iconic in a lot of ways that people will give him a both a bit more slack and also curious about why he isn't talking so you can play off those sort of contradictory impulses simultaneously. Sure, sure. But at the end of the day, just, it's more like if you're dealing with actors who, who really know how to work with their face or how to work with their body language, then, you're, then you know you can get rid of what they're saying, that they can do it all, you know. Or just it puts an onus on what are you trying to tell me? What is the story of this movie? What is happening, you know? Which is all people really want to know is what's going to happen next? What's going on? You know, they don't really want to hear so much about what anybody thinks they just want to know what's happening you know i think when i want when i get when i sit in my back and i watch a movie i just like just tell me what's going to happen next let's go you know when i get impatient with a movie my guest is paul and thomas anderson we're talking about punch drunk love and there's a great n new piece of film that's been added to this that i thought was only going out to members of the press last year that, that basically talk about that uh it's a thing called blossoms and blood which is actually a line from a Newt, Newt Hampson book. It says, uh, love's ways are strewn with blossoms and blood, blossoms and blood, which made a lot of sense to me. And um, it, you know, the sort of traditional thing with DVDs is you have a whole series of scenes that weren't in the movie, and most of the times you thank God they weren't <laughs> in the movie, you know, and you're like... <laughs> <laughs> but, and we had a wealth of stuff. We had, like... Um, we had a lot of extra music and we had a lot of extra artwork that Jeremy Blake had done, stuff that's interspersed through the movie that seemed that seemed actually good enough to put on put out, you know, this sort of the only other venue would have been for our home tapes and it was just a way to like take some of the scenes that didn't end up in the movie, you know, thankfully so, but kind of blend in the music, blend in the artwork and I don't know what it is exactly, but it's about 12 minutes long and it's kind of like a little stoner piece or a little poem piece or whatever it is i'm not sure but it was a way to just do something like i've been saying that was sort of visual and just pictures and just music because i can remember in the middle of doing it really feeling like you're always sort of thinking about what you might be doing next and it was almost sort of like a test to see if uh if ideas that i had might work on something else that i might do in the future that was purely music and, and pictures so that's what it is on the dvd it's called blossoms and blood and um I'm very, really proud of it. I don't know what the hell it is, but I really like it. It's really spooky is what it is. I mean, I went <laughs> and read the poem, I mean, because I, I didn't know him. There's something that's kind of sort of incomplete about it in a weird way, you know what I mean? Kind mm -hmm. of like inchoate, and, and, and the, the kind of formlessness makes it feel like a piece that really comes out of your subconscious. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it was. We did it really quickly. It was. We had sort of a great in the editing room where we were making the movie. John was in one room making the music, and Jeremy was sort of painting on his computer in another room, and we had sort of a whole link of computers and Pro Tools and music. It was just this crazy weird studio where we're sort of constantly trying to think about what do we do with all this stuff? And I was sort of thinking about what might be interesting for the DVD at the point when we were in the middle of editing the movie. Um, and it came about just really, really quickly, really, really quickly. We actually had the idea that we were going to do a whole alternate version of the movie. We were going to kind of use alternate takes. And you know, so there's always a moment when you're making the movie when you have to choose between you know a great performance in take A and a great performance in take B, and you, you have to pick. I thought it might be interesting to kind of go back to the movie and choose alternate takes and kind of at different angles and where it was hard to make a decision. But that was really just a waste of time, a <laughs> joke, and it was like we'd finished the movie and or we'd been close to finishing it, and it was just becoming this complete labor and... I don't know what. I mean, it was dark days for like four or five days trying to do something like that. But out of it, as a sort of break from this kind of really stupid experiment for four or five days that got all of us down and kind of miserable, we just sort of broke into this other new thing and just one Friday afternoon and into the night with a good amount of tequila ended up making or finishing off this Blossoms and Blood thing. And we really, really had a nice time doing it. So it was just a weird thing. Well, that just points to the virtues of tequila and filmmaking, I suppose. Like if John <laughs> Houston was right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think about, though, you're using Adam Sandler here and Tom Cruise in the picture before that, and you seem to find a way to use this kind of, I guess, this relationship the audiences have with movie stars or what we perceive mov- these guys are. And I wonder how do you explain to them that you're going to use part of what it is that they do, the audiences react to, like Tom Cruise's sort of that busyness, that ambition of his to sort of be paid attention to becomes a part of that character. And these perceptions we have about Sandler and this volcanic rage that comes like almost out of nowhere, you go from one extreme to another, but it's like, again, based on kind of an audience reaction. And I wonder if you go to them as kind of an audience member and saying, I like when you do this, and I want to try to use that here, or if you just sort of let them... I think I approach it, you know, as a fan first because I've been a fan of what, they'd, what they've done or what, I, what I've seen them do well that appeals to me and, or what, I, what I'd like to see them do. Um, but also, too, the relationships with both those guys is sort of built out of mu- mutual admiration just for what the other does, you know. Um, Tom had really liked Boogie Nights and wanted to make a movie with me, and I was already sort of formulating that part and had a, a bunch of it written, and it just sort of ended up really kind of coming to life thinking I'm going to I'm going to specifically write this for Tom and with Adam you know I was I was pretty clear about what a fan I was of his and I I I I, I let him I mean when he saw Magnolia he called me and he says like we're not going to do that are we you know and I was like <laughs> no 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 I want to I don't we're not going to do that you know you don't have to do that and he, he's, and I think what he was saying was, you know, what what are you after? And I, I, I let him know I wanted to try and make his movie, you know. Um, the movie has to come to the star. The star can't come to the movie, you, you know. You really think that? Yeah. Why? I learned it early on with Adam. Just we were sort of had this weird, we couldn't really find our footing. Um, I think, I don't know, I think in some weird ways, I think I felt like, as much of a fan of his that I was, it, we were so aware that we were from different worlds that we had to do something, had to do more than we had to really had to do, which all we had to do was just kind of relax and let the work kind of go to work. I, I hope I'm explaining it well because we no, did No, it's like you were saying you are overthinking it a little bit. Yeah, completely overthinking it and overworking it and just sort of beating it into the ground and thinking that there was some obligation to be something else. It sort of really do, does your head in, you know when you sort of get, on, get down that road, and luckily we came out of it. And and I think, like I said, what happens is the movie comes to the star, you know, because that's the movie. I mean, that's that's really what you're looking at when you look at a movie. I think what, what audiences look at when they look at a movie, they're looking at, who am I following here? Who's in it? Well, Adam Sandler's in it. It's, it's Punch Drunk Club. My guess is Paul Thomas Anderson. I guess as I'm asking you all this, too, you're talking about music a little bit here. And there is as much music in your movies as there are basically in 
Minoy musicals. I mean, there's so many music cues. Yeah. And certainly those rhythms, the cutting rhythms, basically, I mean, almost all the stuff with, you know, Phil Seymour Hoffman is like, a, is like punk, you know? I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It's like Lou Reed almost, mm. the way he's in the picture. And I just wondered what you thought about when you, you must be thinking about making a musical at some point. That would be, that would be nice at some point. But, you know, and I think I've said this before, I feel like I've made, I feel like Magnolia was a musical. Yeah, because Just, it's got that a kind of a talicizing that musicals have, but as you're talking about not using dialogue. Yeah. And certainly at the beginning of Magnolia, we use one basically as a piece of narrative prologue yeah. and setting up characters. An entire movie like that. It would be a dream come true. I think I probably put, I have such a love for that genre that I, and I, I put such stock in it and emphasis on it that when I go to do it I feel like oh, God I, I, I better do this right are you a little intimidated by the, the, the genre the musical you know I, I just I think it's I feel like I've done a musical and I feel like I'm intimidated by trying to hit anything on the head you know you don't want to kind of have to go have to try and hit something smack dab on the head although that's what I would really like to do is... Well, a movie without dialogue is not hitting it on the head. I mean, a musical that's t- totally free of dialogue would not be hitting anything on the head at all, would That's it? true. No, it wouldn't. You know, and I'm, I'm, always, I'm always nervous when things hit something on the head. But then again, that's what I want to go see. I don't know. I'm kind of screwed up like that. Like, all I want to... All I want to try and do is sing Melancholy Baby, you know, but then it starts to come out like the Star Spangled Banner half the time, you know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Okay. No, uh, you, you know that feeling. That feeling when you just when when you go to when I you you to trying to do something traditional. I mean, what you're saying is to do a musical would be, you sort of there's long roots there of, of um, long, strong roots that I respect and I would want to. No, sure. Do of course, you want you want to hold to the traditions. But I'm saying too is the musical what really lend itself to a movie that has no dialogue in it. Well, then they'd be singing, wouldn't? They? No, I'm not saying the characters actually sing. Maybe oh. using source music. Oh yeah, yeah. Now you're not a good idea. I guess that's an easy idea. I guess I've been thinking much more complicated about it. I don't know. I have this idea that I've been working on for so long, and I just really just it's trying to make Baraka. Really, you know, I just love. I just love that movie, and I love that format. And it's so moody, though that movie. Yeah, it is. And and Punch Drunk Love is really a movie about. It's actually a movie about moods rather than being a movie a, a movie that's moody, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, and, and basically these characters are trying to strike the right mood between them, th- themselves. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. And I guess we're out of time. Oh, parting is such sweet sorrow. That's <laughs> I, good. Elvis. Thank you very much. Oh, it's always my pleasure to have you here. You know that. Thanks very, very much. It's the DVD release of Punch Drunk Love. It's director, my guest is Paul Thomas Anderson. Our technical director is, of course, Mario Diaz. Thank you, Poppy. Mary Holt produces the program. I'm Elvis Mitchell. It's The Treatment. An audio archive of this and other programs can be found at publicradio.com. For questions and comments about The Treatment, please email us at thetreatment at publicradio.com. The Treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica.